The pulse of the nation isn't monitored by physicians, but by doctors of data. Kristen Soltis Anderson is one of them, and she's one of the best. Named a rising star for her work in the field with a wide following, this groundbreaking author of The Selfie Vote has specialized in discerning what younger voters and women are looking for and move by. In a presidential race that may be close, that could make all the difference. From Ballard Studios in Washington, D.C., it's 13th and Park. We give you information, not a panic attack. We look what's going on. I mean, my God. This was it. The kids were going to die. That time is gone forever. This is the biggest story in America. We weren't prepared for this. Don't you want to speak truth to power? Toughest thing I ever had to do. Kristen, I can't tell you how much I was looking forward to this interview, to hear your thoughts on the new world. I was going to say the new world oh from goodness. a couple of days ago, and now it's new all over again because of Kamala Harris. Who even knows what will have happened by the time we finish this interview? <laughs> right. I turned my phone back on. Right. Aliens could have invaded and nothing would surprise me at this point. Well, you've got all these events that are happening. You've got the debate, then the assassination attempt. Then you had a Republican convention, President Biden saying he's not going to run. Then you have Kamala Harris trying to quickly marshal the Democratic forces together. How do you keep up with that as a pollster? It's very challenging because in an ideal world, if you think of polling as a science, think about how somebody in a lab would want to do something. Correlation is not causation. So you would love, ideally, to have things more isolated. So you could say, OK, I did a poll and right. then something happened and then I did a poll after it and I was able to track how much did that one event change things. Well, when you go into the field and then you come out of the field and five world altering events all happen, <laughs> how do you assess is this something that is caused by the Republican convention? Is it caused by the assassination attempt? Is it caused by Kamala Harris becoming elevated to presumptive nominee? You can't disentangle it. So right. when people say, well, did the Republican convention benefit Republicans? It's easy to say, oh, yes or no, the polls went up or down. But actually, the, the intellectually honest answer is I don't really know because there are five different things that all happened that could have caused whatever movement we see in polls. I know in campaigns I've been involved with, when we would do nightly tracks and the other side was not, that was always a huge advantage because we could see actually in terms of our messaging, our ads, et cetera, what was working and what wasn't. And the others who were maybe tracking every week right. were always behind the curve, not knowing the same answers to the questions that we were uh, finding for ourselves. How important is it that polling is an almost everyday affair now to keep up with, again, the, the pace of events? Well, I like to think of it as a dashboard on your car. You have lots of different gauges that tell you different but critically important things as you are driving. What's my speed? Do I have enough gas? What direction am I going? And polling is one of the many gauges that you need to constantly be checking in order to know, am I on track? If any of your gauges aren't working right, you might run out of gas. You might make the wrong turn. You might get pulled over for speeding. And so, you know, polling is not the only gauge you should be looking at, how's my fundraising doing? What's my ground game? You know, how's our, my field operations say things are going? What's the conversation online? These are all important inputs, but polling is one of the most critical. And if you are depriving yourself of that, you may as well be driving a car with the windshield blacked out. We talked before this interview about how you had a feeling that maybe you should be polling Kamala Harris as much as Joe Biden. You put that into a survey. I want to share some of the results uh, from your survey, get your thoughts on this. So the first thing we're looking at, the question is, ask who they'd want to replace Biden. Most Democrats say they'd like Kamala Harris to step in. Do you think this is a reflection of what's now happening, which is a quick coalescing around Kamala, knowing that yeah, this is the least risky way to go at the last hundred days of a campaign where suddenly the name at the top is no longer. Absolutely. Um, I had some folks who were asking me, hey, would you be willing to, you know, give some thoughts about what a potential Gretchen Whitmer versus Donald Trump contest would look like? Yeah. But as soon as I saw those numbers, I thought this is this is all pointless. This is going to coalesce around Harris, because, frankly, if you are Newsom or Whitmer or one of these other folks that polls OK, but not as well as Harris right now. Right. If you disrupt this, then you suddenly put a ton of risk on yourself. If things don't work out for Democrats, oh, you're the one that caused disunity. You prevented us from coalescing around Harris. I mean, there's just so much potential risk there. So it seemed as though because Biden had run, you know, three weeks off the clock after that debate, right. 
they just don't have enough time to go through some Aaron Sorkin fantasy land process of trying to choose someone new. Now, Harris brings with her a lot of potential risks for Democrats that you might not have from a Newsom or a Whitmer or somebody else. What are those risks? Um, So, for instance, not to quote our vice president too directly, but she is not unburdened by what has been in the way that somebody else might be. She will be less able to disentangle herself from the Biden administration's policies. Now, if you believe that the reason why Biden was polling so poorly against Trump was entirely about his age, Mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it was just about his age. There was enough polling data that I saw where when you asked voters, do you think you were better off under Trump or Biden? They'd say Trump. Who do you think is better at handling immigration? Trump. Who do you think is better at handling crime? Trump. I mean, there are tons of policy areas, pretty much everything except for the issue, maybe health care, definitely abortion, but almost every other issue. Right. Policy wise, Trump was beating Biden. Isn't your experience at the end of the line? Generally, people vote in their self-interest, whatever that is. Yes. And those issues are directly to those self-interests, aren't they? Very much so. And I I also think that it's very easy for us in the political consulting world to think about voters as very easily compartmentalizing things. Well, are they going to vote on personality? Are they going to vote on policy? Personality is policy to a lot of voters. Is this person of sound mind and body and are they going to be a stable leader who makes good decisions? That flows immediately into, are they somebody I can trust to handle the economy? Are they somebody I can trust to secure the border? So I think political consultants and pollsters are guilty of this all the time. We think of these things as distinct and discrete characteristics that voters are parsing separately, and they're they're not. not. It's all one big soup that just, in the end, leads to a decision that is guided by their mind and their heart. This is one I thought was interesting. So still a lot of Democrats wanted, quote unquote, an open process. Did they really want that? So I would bet that if I did this poll again today that number would drop dramatically. So bear in mind, this was a poll that came out of the field as Biden announced he was (laughs) no no longer running. I thought, do we just have to throw this entire poll in the trash? But we don't. There's interesting stuff in it. But it gave you the signal, first of all, that the Harris coronation, so to speak, was likely to proceed apace and not face too much resistance. There may be some Democrats who privately grumble. And I especially think that if ultimately Trump is victorious in November, there's going to be a lot of finger pointing and recriminations. And why didn't we have a more open process? Why didn't Biden step aside earlier and all of that? So you can see some of that in these numbers. But right now you do have 48 percent who even before the events of Sunday, Mm -hmm. before the withdrawal of Biden said, let's just make the switch. Let's make it quick and clean, and let's not have any drama, infighting, or chaos. And then you had another 13% that felt like you could still have an open process, but ultimately wanted that process to lead to Harris. Mm -hmm. So she had a majority of Democrats saying they wanted her to be at the top of the ticket, you know, post-Biden in the midst of all of this, even before it became pretty evident that that was what was going to happen. So let's go to the next slide. This has to do with likability. So you said, as Trump's favorables have increased... He has narrowly surpassed Harris in that favorability. Now, it's been reported widely, and you've seen this in poll after poll in your own polling, that Kamala Harris has had kind of mixed marks to this point. Does Kamala have to really address the likability part of this early? And does she get really a second chance at a first impression? I think she does get a second chance at a first impression. So part of our research this week was we asked people to give us an answer. In one word, how would you describe Kamala Harris? Mm. A lot of people took more than one word in the survey. They did extra credit. And you found that Democrats generally, it was they were viewing her as pretty competent, pretty experienced, pretty effective. Republicans, it was a mix of she's unlikable, she's unqualified, things that are unprintable, frankly. <laughs> but for a lot of the independents or people who were unsure for whom they'd vote in a, say, Trump-Biden contest, which wasn't a ton, but some... They really didn't have a strong impression of her. They Mm. felt like, I don't see her that often. I don't hear from her that often. I don't love what I've seen, but I I just feel like I don't know enough to have a strong opinion. It's very easy for people who work in politics to assume that everybody has strongly formed opinions about everybody who could potentially be a Democratic contender. I get asked a lot, well, how would Mark Kelly versus Josh Shapiro change the ticket? I'm like, their national name ID is... is Unbelievably low, right. which doesn't mean it won't get very high very quickly and people won't form an opinion. But most voters are not sitting at home like, gee, let me let me think about the governor of a state that's on the other side of the country. And so Harris, even though she is the vice president, I still think there's going to be a getting to know you process. 
the reality is, as a communicator, she has been uneven. That's like the most dip diplomatic it. way I can use yeah, it. There are word. moments where yeah. Democrats point to and they go, look at how strong and sharp a messenger mm -hmm. she is on something like abortion. And then Republicans will share a montage of her saying kind of word salady things that don't make a lot of sense or the same kind of strange quotes. What will be fascinating for me to see is can Harris turn some of this awkwardness that I don't think is going to go away. I don't think she magically becomes the Democratic nominee right. and suddenly gains a ton of superpowers. She is still the person who ran a very flawed campaign for president in 2020 and who as vice president has not always been a rock star. But it's been interesting to me the way she has almost had her awkwardness turned into meme ability. You now see people online, if you like Kamala Harris, you can indicate it by putting a coconut emoji in your <laughs> bio because she has that right. sort of awkward speech where she says, you think you fell out of a coconut tree. You exist in the context of all in which you live and all that came before you, which is a sentence if you tried to diagram it out as an English teacher would be a bit odd. I had to turn to my daughter to yes. understand coconut. <laughs> coconut what, is that? Build. what are we talking about here? <laughs> so in a hypothetical head to head taken before Biden's withdrawal, but just before Trump edges out Harris by two point margin. Now, you and I know something. When you look at national horse race polls, it's always fun, right? Oh, gosh, they're within a point of each other, within three points. Of it. it doesn't really matter. We have an electoral college that's going to drive the winner of this election in the target states, as you know. And some of this come, has come from your polling, some of this from other polling. Right now, in each of the six major target states, the best that Harris is against Trump. I think she's tied in Michigan, but she's down everywhere else, down by six in Arizona, right. nearly a dozen in Nevada. She's down in Georgia. She's down in Wisconsin. And of course, in Pennsylvania, I think she's also down four or five points. And then beyond that, you've got other states that aren't a part of the big six. You've got Virginia, where a recent polls showed mm -hmm. Harris trails by four points to President Trump. You have New Jersey, of all places, dead heat. So when you look at the swing states. Which states maybe in particular do you think could swing the most from the numbers that you see today between Harris and Trump? And could that be a determinant of winners and losers? So think about what the Harris coalition looks like and how it differs from the Biden coalition. Okay. Let's take young voters, for mm -hmm. instance. I have long been preaching that Republicans are in big trouble with young voters because their message has kind of failed to resonate, that young voters have consistently been moving to the left on policy. This has been going on since Barack Obama came on the scene and ran for president in 2008. This is a longtime phenomenon. And then you get to the Trump-Biden era, mm -hmm. and some of that seems to level off. I've been getting a lot of, hey, look, Donald Trump may actually be winning among young voters. See, look, it was possible to win them over. I fully believe it's possible for Republicans to win them over. But what I am curious about is how much of that was young voters simply saying, I cannot with Joe Biden. I can't. Joe Biden uniquely upended the generational polarization we saw during the Obama era. The Obama era, suddenly you had young voters and their grandparents voting very differently. Yes. And then Biden comes along, Trump, Biden, that evens out a little bit. Younger voters just can't with Biden, but older voters like Biden a heck of a lot more than they liked Obama. Does Harris suddenly reset that again? Suddenly she gets more enthusiasm from young voters, from voters of color who had been a little bit lukewarm on Biden in some ways, um, especially black men. Biden had been losing them. Latino voters, you know, that's a, a group that Democrats have done quite well with, at least nationally over the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. But Trump had made real inroads made there. Made inroads, right. So does Harris scramble that? If Harris scrambles that, it could mean that some of these upper Midwest blue wall type states where Joe Biden had that real kind of working class Scranton Joe appeal. Does that get further out of reach? But at the same time, does a state like Georgia suddenly come back and play? At the same time, does a state like Arizona maybe come back and play? I'm skeptical of any polls at the moment, even my own, on the horse race between mm -hmm. Harris and Trump because her as a hypothetical candidate is not the same as her as a real candidate. Right. So we still got a little time to see, but I think she may change the map a little bit because her coalition will be different. What would you suggest to Team Trump in what could be a generational change in the temperature and the direction of this campaign that they should be considering now that they wouldn't have considered when they were up against Joe Biden? What they need to do is be very careful to keep their message as policy focused as possible. 
There is plenty of stuff they can talk about when it comes to her record on being one of the people Biden tasked with handling the immigration issue. Harris's record on an issue like crime. Both can upset progressives if you talk about the Kamala is a cop type stuff. But also, you know, she supported a bail fund that, you know, Republicans have already started targeting that. And so there is stuff that is policy oriented around kind of law and order, safety and security type issues that I think already favors Republicans, and they can double down on that pretty successfully. What I worry about is, for instance, you see Trump putting out messaging. You know, it's unfair that they've switched up the ticket and those sorts of (laughs) things. I mean, I get that he may think that, but maybe don't post it. That is not going to be your strongest messaging. Are voters looking at what's going on on the Democratic side and think it's strange? They do think it's odd that so many people claimed Biden was fine for so long Mm -hmm. and didn't. Harris is going to have to answer for all of those questions. But I think if your core argument against her is she covered up Joe Biden's infirmity, you are missing the issue areas on which you already have an advantage over Democrats in an administration where she was part and parcel. She does not get to walk away from it in the way that a Newsom or a Whitmer could say, that wasn't me. This was her. It was a Biden-Harris administration. So in an ideal world, you would think that Team Harris wants to prosecute this as a referendum on Donald Trump. Very much And Team Trump wants to prosecute this as a referendum on what is, what's going on in this country on every major front that Americans feel very down the mouth about. I have long believed that this election will hinge on whoever swing voters believe is most likely to bring about some sense of normalcy and stability. Now, Donald Trump in 2016 did not run as Mr. Normalcy and Stability. He ran as I'm a wrecking ball. And He's voters, a disruptor, right. Voters then wanted that. Mm-hmm. But then in 2020, they ran against Joe Biden, and Donald Trump said, this guy is running from his basement. He is Sleepy Joe. And voters said, honestly, maybe Sleepy Joe is fine. <laughs> maybe I want a president I don't have to think about that much. Right. What they learned very quickly was that actually the absence of strong presidential leadership invites chaos. And so Mm -hmm. beginning with the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, the rise in inflation, COVID kind of, you know, you have the Omicron outbreak happen Mm -hmm. under Biden's watch. You had just a lot of things occur where voters went, oh, maybe weak leadership invites chaos. And I actually don't want the sleepy guy in his basement. That was key to undergirding all of Biden's real weakness Mm -hmm. on a whole host of policy areas up until he withdrew. Um, So what either side needs to demonstrate is that I'm going to be a strong leader, not necessarily a wrecking ball, but I'm going to be someone who wants you to be able to live your life, afford your home, afford your groceries, afford your health care, live happily, not have the government coming in, making your life miserable. It's not rocket science what swing voters are looking for. And Trump and Harris are each going to try to persuade those key voters that the other side is just four more years of chaos, of stress, of instability. Well, you talk about the number one issue being the economy. I call it the pocketbook, right? It's like whether or not I can pay the bills. Yes, That's something I think that Donald Trump went after big in 16, was kind of maybe the hidden part of the secret sauce to his victory that a lot of people were struggling, whereas the national media and the Democrats were saying, you know, everything's fine, we're moving forward, et cetera. Could that be the final determinant among these swing voters you're talking about in the swing states? I think it's very likely to be one of the biggest assets that the Trump team has is that for all his time as president. And look, when Donald Trump was president, his job approval wasn't always great. But people now reflect back on his administration and they think, I had it better off then. Laura Trump's speech at the RNC was one of the best speeches there in terms of making the positive case for Trump. And a line that really stuck out was, if you want to know what the next four years would be like, you don't have to imagine it. Just remember what it was like, that people now... Correctly or incorrectly, they remember the Trump era as being one of more prosperity than they are feeling now. This is why when Joe Biden ran on a message of Bidenomics, it was crazy. I right? thought it was. Re- I thought, who is who's telling you to do this? That right. sounds like something a, the RNC is going to use in their ads. <laughs> right. Bidenomics. Right. It is much harder for Democrats right now to have an economic message because they are stuck between "I feel your pain" and "I did a great job." How do you thread that needle? For Republicans, it's much more simple. I feel your pain and I'll do better. That's a much cleaner, easier message to deliver. I think that's the 30 second ad, by the way. I wish I had my cameras out (laughs) going at it. So I remember when the selfie vote came out, when you authored that, it's a groundbreaking book. For those who haven't read it still, which is nearly 10 years now, it was the quintessential analysis, not just of younger voters and what they're looking for, but 
what they aspire for. Has anything changed in those nine years, nine plus years since you authored that? Uh, Millennials got old. We're no longer the cool kids on the block. (laughs) We are now, in fact, I think the word is cringe. (laughs) It's probably cringe that I just said that. Anyhow, you know, millennials got older. Troublingly for Republicans, they did not move that much to the right. They moved a very slight bit to the right as they aged. But the baseline was so progressive to begin with that they're still you know, somewhat reliably Democratic voters. You really have to get all the way up to Gen X before you find voters who are pretty solidly Republican. Gen Z came on the scene, and they're different than millennials. Millennials came of age very optimistic to begin with, and then, like, the world kind of beat them down. Mm -hmm. They graduated. You know, their first political memory was around 9-11 for the oldest millennials. You had the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. You had the financial crisis. You had the political discord that came about during the Obama presidency. And it was just felt like, oh, we can't get anything done. And so millennials started out optimistic and then became disappointed. Gen Z started out angry and has stayed angry. They have come of age in an era where they don't know anything but the type of political conflict that we're living in now. The idea that like the stakes around everything are existential. So they are very upset, frustrated, and they're much more ready to blow things up than millennials who wanted change but were a little more kind of pragmatic, Mm -hmm. incrementalist. The aspirations overall are still the same. I want to be able to get a good education, have a good job, buy a home. Not a lot of debt. You know, not have a lot of debt. It's in some ways not rocket science. Their views on things like family might be a little bit different. You know, some of them apprehensive about starting families or maybe that's not as much a piece of what they're looking for or they, they, they just feel like they can't afford it. So some of the pieces of what we might stereotypically think of as the American dream will look a little different to them. In the end, they just do feel like a lot of the systems that we have in place or the things that their generation was told to do, ah, if you do X, Y, and Z, you'll be successful. They feel like they followed those rules and there was no prize at the end for them. And that means in some ways, Democrats keep giving Republicans a reprieve. Young voters are not necessarily conservative, but they are increasingly agitated. What they feel is the failures of the systems that are currently in place. And they view Democrats as complicit in those systems. As complicit, right. And that's why younger voters are so They're very tuned into politics. They haven't checked out, but they're very agitated with and uninspired by a lot of the current leaders on the scene. So Kamala Harris, right out of the gate, (laughs) she decides to go brat. And I had to look that one up, too. Let me play you this clip and get your reaction. The singer Charlie XCX tweeted last night, Kamala is brat. And this is in reference to her album. It's called Brat. Kamala has branded her Kamala HQ Twitter page with the same aesthetic of the album, that's another Gen Z word, aesthetic. It's even becoming a trend on TikTok. Special Gen Z correspondent, Jamie, what what can you tell us about So, So first of all, Charlie XCX, who I do know, quote, Brat, you're just that girl who is a little messy and likes to party and maybe says some dumb things sometimes, end quote. She's gone right at a young demographic that I didn't know existed, to be honest about it. I mean, I want to be brat when I start seeing that. I want to be dancing on TikTok. I mean, could this make any kind of difference (laughs) with younger voters? So what I think is so potentially good for Harris in this is that there was an attempt to make Joe Biden memeable, dark Brandon, all of Mm -hmm. this, but it always felt a little forced and inorganic. To the extent that any of this is organic, that's very interesting. And that's that's kind of different than your campaign trying to, like, force it into the world. So if Harris can generate organic excitement among Generation Z mm-hmm. in a way that Biden just really couldn't, that's interesting. That changes a little bit of the game of, of 2024. So as soon as that Kamala is brat came out and I thought, OK, that's that's funny, but One of the key problems that Harris's campaign had in 2020 was that it was driven by young staffers who thought that Twitter was real life. (laughs) They thought that online discourse was representative of the median voter. And so there is a real risk of campaigns getting too caught up in their own message and being too excited about what they're seeing on the Internet and failing to realize that the median voter in America does not know or care who Charlie XCX is, right? That it's okay to have messaging that targets a very specific niche audience and energizes them. That's fine. That's great. But if your entire message becomes built around and driven by energizing people on TikTok, 
and neglects the voters who have no yes. idea what you're talking about, right. there's a real risk there. So she, there, there is the potential for her becoming the two online candidate and missing. What does a key swing voter in the state of Pennsylvania look like? <laughs> Do they know what Brad is? Right. Being realistic about that assessment. <laughs> I hate to put you on the spot, but I, I will. Uh, and we're still far out, right, right, from November. How do you think this is going to play out? I think that you are going to see Harris in the immediate short term start to do a couple points better than we had been seeing with Biden. You are going to see Democrats getting excited. Energy is going to be on her side. To the extent that pollsters were having any sort of differential response rate issues where they were like fired up Trump people. Yes, let me take your poll and depressed Biden people. No, please don't ask me. La, 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 I don't want to hear about it. You're going to see a little bit of that shift. Mm -hmm. If the battle is less between Trump versus Harris and vote versus not vote on the Democratic side, a Harris candidacy could help them with a, some key voter groups like young voters mm -hmm for whom the couch was looking real appealing in November. So I think you're going to see Harris bump up initially. The question is, how does she ultimately get defined? Does the Trump campaign get disciplined about defining her? Not chasing after, oh, look, she says the word unburdened a bunch of times. Look, she made this awkward coconut speech. But instead, getting really sharp and incisive on policy and not overdoing it on the kind of cringy personal attacks. That would be the best way to go. And for Harris, it has to be a little bit of embracing the awkward to try to convert it into likability, as well as trying to find ways to draw whatever policy contrast she can that she think will help her, I think, again, in particular on an issue like abortion. Do you think it's going to be a close election? I think it will, because I think we live in such polarized times. I did a focus group for The New York Times of 11 voters who were disappointed in Joe Biden. They had voted for him in 2020, but then said they disapproved of the job he was doing as president. And in the focus group, I asked them, I said, do you think that Joe Biden can serve four more years as president? And they all said no. And then at the end of the group, I said, are you going to vote for Joe Biden? And they said, yeah, probably. That's how polarized we are, right. that people dislike Donald Trump enough to say, I would vote for someone that I literally don't think could serve another four years. I suspect all of those folks will vote for Kamala Harris in the end as well, now that she's the choice. And similarly, you have folks that love Donald Trump so much or just think that Democrats are going to drive the country into the ground so severely that Donald Trump can say or do anything. And these voters are like, I don't care. Oh, another mean tweet. Breaking news. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I don't care. We are in such polarized times that even after, you know, when when the assassination attempt came in, you saw a lot of immediate talk about Democrats going, this race is over. Trump right. is going to win 400 electoral votes. And that was so premature. Like, I get that this was a, a really unbelievable moment in American history that our grandchildren and great grandchildren are going to be talking about. But in terms of movement in the polls, we're so polarized. Yeah. Even something monumental like that might not move it that much. So that's where I'm putting my marker down. I think it's going to be close. Well, I know one thing for sure. You're not going to get a lot of sleep in the next couple of <laughs> <Nope>. months. <laughs> a lot of people want to hear what you have to think, what you're seeing in the numbers and what's underneath the numbers, which, of course, is always as important as the, the head to heads. Me. Go get them. Uh, <laughs> keep educating America about, you know, why this is an important election, why they have a big stake in this election. And we'll see what happens by the time we reach the finish line. Well, thank you for having me, Adam. Great to have you.